Today, we're going to look at the fundamental theorem of calculus um, in part two of it, all right? And this is really the part that allows us to find what a definite integral is without using graphs or the area or knowing the area or any of those things, all right? This is going to come from antiderivatives, okay? So, so the theorem says this, okay? If f, if lowercase f, which is the this function right here that we're integrating is a continuous is a continuous function on the closed interval a to b, and if capital F is any antiderivative of f on the closed interval interval a to b, then this is what it says: if you take the integral from a to b of this function f of x, it's equal to the antiderivative of the upper limit at b minus um, the upper um, the lower limit of the and uh, the deri I'm saying this wrong, guys. Hold on, back up. This is saying if you take the integral from a to b of this function f of x, it's equal to the antiderivative at b minus the antiderivative at a. Whew. Okay, that's what I was trying to say. <laughs> all right. Okay, so to get used to this a little bit, all right, I want to look at a function, okay, h of x, and let's say it's x squared plus three then we know its derivative h prime of x would have to be 2x, okay? So function to derivative. But if we start with this, we could call the derivative a function. And then this h of x is equal to x squared plus three is called the antiderivative. So we're going backwards. All right, if G, if let's say, I'm gonna call this one R of X. If R of X is X squared plus five, R prime of X would equal two X. So, all right, so then if this was called the function, if the derivative was the function, then this R of X would be the antiderivative of it. Okay, so that's what I'm gonna do next is if H of X is equal to two X, the notation that we use for antiderivative is a capital letter for the function. So the antiderivative of H is capital H of X. And that's gonna be, in this case, if we know this is the derivative or this is the function, this is the derivative, then the if this was the function, then the antiderivative, if it came from this would be X squared plus three. Similarly, if R of X, was equal to 2x, then capital R of x, when this case would be x squared plus five. So we, we use capital letters to mean antiderivative. That's the notation. Instead of prime, okay, we use this um, capital H. So this would be the function now. And then these would be the antiderivative. Now, I want you to notice something here, that these two functions are actually both 2x, right? But they came from two different antiderivatives. And so what's the difference between them? It's this constant c, okay? All right, so here we go. I'm gonna show you where why this works, okay? And so we gotta use what we learned yesterday to help us out. And so we're gonna let capital G of x, that's that integral function, okay? equal the integral from a to x of f of t dt. Okay, so from yesterday, right, we know that capital G prime of x um, is equal to, well, all we have to do is put the x in, right? This would just be f of x. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the antiderivative of both sides. So the antiderivative of G prime would be G of X. And the antiderivative of this function F of X would be capital F of X plus some constant C. Manipulating this, okay, this tells me that capital G of X minus C would equal capital F of X. Okay, 
So we're going to use this to help us figure out, okay, what is the antiderivative of at, at a value B? So capital F of B minus capital F of A. And so these are both antiderivatives of this function F, okay? And so we know that from this, that F of capital F of B would be G of B minus C. So I'm gonna put that in a bracket. So G of B minus C, this is, this is right here, F of capital F of B. All right, and then we're gonna subtract and capital F of A, I just use say capital F because it's just easier than say antiderivative, okay? Capital F of A would be G, capital G of A minus C. And this part right here, that is capital F of A. Okay, so if I take out the brackets, this becomes G of B minus C minus G of A plus C. So this minus C and this plus C, these C's are gonna cancel out. And so we're left with capital G of B minus capital G of A. But what is the G function? The G function says that's the integral from A to B of F of T dt. So this one right here is the integral from A to B of F of T dt minus, and we're gonna do G of A, that'd be the integral from A to A, the integral from A to A of F of T dt. All right, so that makes this, because we're integrating from A to A, that makes this zero. That makes this equal to the integral from A to B. Now, we're no longer ending this X, so I, I can actually switch this back to X's now because, because now we're actually, this is a lower limit and upper limit. These are both constants now and not a variable. Okay, so then this becomes, we can switch that, this T right here back to our X because that was just a dummy variable. So what is, what is this saying, all right? So this is saying that the integral from A to B of F of X DX can be found by taking the antiderivative of this and putting B in and subtracting the antiderivative at A. That's it. So this is a matter of just finding the antiderivative and putting your upper and lower limits into it. All right. So what we're going to do next is we're going to integrate from one to two x squared minus three. So this is going to allow me to find this without using graphs like we've been doing. Okay. So what's the, der the antiderivative of x squared minus three? Well, we got to add one to the power and divide by that power, right? So this becomes, um, we're gonna add one to the power, so that's gonna become x cubed, and we're gonna divide by that power, which is three minus, and then this is x to the zero right now. When I add to it, it's gonna become minus three x. Okay, so that's the anti, this is the antiderivative of x squared minus three. It's x cubed over three minus three x. If you were to take the derivative of this, it would give you x squared minus three. Okay, so you can think of it like that. And then the notation we use for this is we draw a vertical line and we, you've seen that before. And so we're gonna evaluate this from one to two. So then we're gonna write this is equal, okay? And some people put a bracket around this and then on the, and that's just an alternative way of doing it, okay? Um, some people put a bracket around all of this and then write the lower one as a one and the upper here is a two. And so we want to put this two in because that's the upper limit. We always put that one in first. So I'm going to write a bracket and this would be two cubed over three minus three times two, close the bracket, subtract, and then bracket. So this is your basically your antiderivative at two. And this one's going to be your antiderivative at one. So this is going to be one cubed over three minus three times one. So this would be eight thirds minus six minus 
one third minus three. And actually what I would do, because I see some thirds, I would actually distribute this subtraction right here. So this becomes eight thirds minus six minus one third plus three. So this is gonna make seven thirds and negative six and the positive three makes minus three. And now you need to get a common denominator. So seven thirds minus nine thirds, because nine thirds is three. And this gives you a value of, I'm gonna come down here, of negative two thirds. And we just found the integral without looking at any areas. All right. For this next one, we need to rewrite this as a power. So I'm gonna rewrite this. This is still the integral from one to four of three x to the one half power dx. Okay, because we're dealing with a fractional exponent, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave a little bit of gap when I start doing the antiderivative, okay? So we can also bring this constant out, okay, if you want to, or you could leave it in there and just go, okay, this is going to be three times. So this is where I'm going to leave some space. So I'm going to leave some space because I know I'm going to have to divide by a fraction, which means I'm going to multiply by the reciprocal. So this is going to be x to the and I need to add one to this. Now, because the denominator is two, I'm gonna add two halves to this, which makes three halves. And I'm gonna divide by three halves, but a better way is to multiply by two thirds. So this is gonna be times two thirds. And I'm gonna evaluate this from one to four. Okay, so back to this. Um, here, we're gonna clean this up before we completely evaluate. This would just, we'd be left with two x to the three halves evaluated from one to four. So I'm gonna use brackets here. This would be two times four to the three halves power minus and two times one to the three halves power. Okay, so um, it's easier to take the square root because that's what this two means. This denominator of two in the exponent means square root. So square root four and then cube it. So the square root of four is two cubed is eight. So this one becomes two times eight minus the square root of one is one cube one cubed is one times two. So this would just be times two or minus two. And so this becomes 16 minus two which is 14. And that's the answer to this. All right. So this is one that, okay, you have to know your derivative rules in order to know the antiderivative, okay? So I know that the derivative of tan x is secant squared x. So that means the antiderivative of secant squared x would have to be tan x. So this is equal to, okay, the antiderivative, which would be tan of x. And we're gonna evaluate it from zero to pi over four. So that makes this tangent of pi over four minus tangent of zero. Okay, the angle pi over four is in the first quadrant. So I'm gonna draw my little diagram here. I know because this is pi over four, this is a 45, 45, 90 right triangle. So that makes this side one and this side one because X and Y are both positive in this quadrant and this would be the square root of two. Tangent is the Y over the X. So this one's gonna be one over one. That's the ratio at pi over four minus, and then I'm gonna draw a diagram for tangent of zero. Now tangent of zero would be right here, okay? And so we got to realize, okay, my X there is one, my Y would be zero, and my R would be one. Tangent is my Y over X. So this would be, this ratio would be zero over one. So that makes this one minus zero or one. Again, this is one where you have to recognize that this came from um, you have to know your derivative rules, right? And the derivative of tan inverse is one over one plus X squared, okay? So that means this is tan inverse of X. So it's just knowing the, der the derivative of tan inverse of X 
is one over one plus X squared. Okay, so I'm gonna evaluate this from one to the square root of three. And that means tan inverse of the square root of three minus tan inverse of one. You always have to remember, and this is a common mistake, you gotta put the upper limit in first, okay? It's not, it's not the antiderivative of A minus the antiderivative of B, it's the antiderivative of B minus the antiderivative at A, okay? All right, now we gotta recall that these are ratios. So that means this is really tan inverse of the square root of three over one minus tan inverse of one over one. So because it's tan inverse, remember from last spring, I'm, I'm limited to either in this quadrant with a positive angle or down here in this quadrant with a negative angle. And I can't hit pi over two because that would make it, it undefined. So I know because this ratio is positive, I'm gonna draw this one in the first quadrant because this is telling me my y is the square root of three and my x is one because that's the tangent ratio. And because of that, I know this is would have to be two and that makes this angle pi over three. Okay, because always opposite the square root of three is pi over three. So that makes this angle for tan inverse of square root of three over one, pi over three. What happens when the y and the x are both one? Well, I'm gonna draw a diagram for that one. Well, because my y is one and my x is one, so I'm gonna go right one and up one. And because this ratio is positive, I'm gonna draw it here. And so we should recognize, okay, if that's one, that's one, this has to be the square root of two. And then this has to be the angle pi over four. So I'm gonna subtract pi over four. So now I'm gonna get a common denominator. So I need to get a common denominator of 12. So this would be four pi over 12 minus three pi over 12, which gives me an answer of pi over 12. And that's the answer to this. The answer to this integral is pi over 12. All right, guys. All right. In order to integrate this absolute value function, we don't know what the antiderivative of an absolute value is, right? So what we need to do is we need to have the ability to rewrite absolute value equations, okay? Um, so absolute value of 2x minus 1 it all depends whether, um, whether you do something to it or not is whether this 2x minus one is either positive or zero or negative, okay? So if it's positive or zero, we're not gonna change anything because this 2x minus one, when you take the absolute value of it, you would keep it positive, you'd keep it the same number, okay? So we're gonna rewrite this as the absolute value of 2x minus one is equal to, and we're gonna break this into a piecewise function. And I always like to think about, okay, what do I do when this is positive? We just leave it alone, right? So, it, so when two X minus one, when two X minus one is greater than or equal to zero, which is what's in the absolute value, when that's greater than or equal to zero, we're not gonna do anything. It's just gonna be the same thing, two X minus one, okay? But if the two X minus one was less than zero, okay, if it's less than zero, in other words, if it was negative, then we need to make a positive. And the way to make a positive is to multiply the two X minus one by a negative. So negative of two X minus one, because we automatically know that this two X minus one is gonna be negative because of what this says, okay? Now we're gonna clean this up a little bit. And so we get the absolute value of two X minus one is equal to, and here's my piecewise function. This becomes negative two X plus one, but it's only that when X is less than positive one half. Cause I'm adding one and dividing by two. That's how I get the one half. And then it's just gonna be two X minus one when, and we're gonna add one and divide by two. So when X is greater than or equal to positive one half. Okay, so because now I can find the antiderivative of this and I can find the antiderivative of this. So that's the whole idea behind it, okay? Is if we wanna take um, the integral from zero to two of the absolute value of two X minus one, 
dx, what we're going to have to do is break it up into its individual pieces. So since we're going to zero to two and, it, and the change happens at one half, we're going to break it up at one half. So this is going to be the integral from zero to one half of, and before it's one half, it's going to be this negative two x plus one. So negative two x plus one, and then dx, and then we're going to add the integral from one half to two of the two X minus one and then DX. Okay, so let's start getting the antiderivative of these. So this one's gonna be negative two X squared over two minus one X over one or just minus X. And we are gonna evaluate that. And here I'm gonna use a bracket. So this is what I was talking about earlier. And we're gonna evaluate that from zero to one half. And then we're going to add to that a bracket. And this one would be 2x squared over 2. And this would be minus x. And you guys, I wrote this wrong. Okay. You guys back up here. Okay. So from 0 to 1 half, it's not negative 2x minus 1. It's negative 2x plus 1. So this needs to be a plus 1. And that would, that would make changes from a minus x to a plus x. Sorry about that. Okay, easy to make a mistake like that. Okay, so just be a little careful on it. All right. And then this one is minus, and this would be minus x. And this would be evaluated from one half to two. Okay. Now I'm going to have to put one. Oh, well, before I put one half in here, this is going to clean up. I would clean this up before I start plugging numbers in. So this one becomes negative x squared plus x evaluated from zero to one half, and then plus, and then this one becomes just x squared minus x, evaluated from one half to two. Okay, so I'm gonna use a parenthesis, and that I'm gonna use that parenthesis to show this first evaluation, okay? And then I'm gonna use a bracket for putting one half in here. So this is gonna be negative of one half squared plus one half, that's putting one half in here and then minus and then bracket. And then I'm going to put zero in here. So that'd be negative zero squared plus zero. Close parentheses. So I'm using the parentheses to show the evaluation from zero to one half of this. And I'm using brackets to show me putting one half in here and zero in. And then this addition right here is going to be right here. And then parentheses. And then again, I'm going to use brackets right here to show plugging the two in. So this would be two squared minus two, close the bracket, and then minus putting one half in. So another bracket, and then one half squared minus one half, close the bracket, close the parenthesis for the end of the evaluation of this um, antiderivative. Okay, so now this is gonna be negative one fourth plus one half, And then this, since this is going to be zero squared plus zero, that's just going to be zero. So minus zero. If you didn't write minus zero, that'd be okay. And I'm going to close the parenthesis. And then plus, and then this parenthesis right here. And this would be four minus two. And then this would be minus one fourth. Because one half squared is one fourth. And then this is going to become plus one half. And so this is, I'm going to start getting rid of the parentheses now. This would be negative one fourth plus one half. I really don't need that minus zero. I don't need to write it. Um, plus, so this is going to be two. So plus two and then minus one fourth and then plus one half. So this is going to be negative two fourths. I'm going to come off here to the side. Negative two fourths because that's the negative one fourth and the negative one fourth. And the one half plus the one half makes one plus two. So plus one plus two. Negative two fourths is negative one half. So this is negative one half plus three. And so we're gonna get a common denominator of two. So this is negative one half plus six halves because six halves is three. 
And so that gives you a value of sliding it up a little bit, five halves. And that's the integral from zero to two of this absolute value function. All right. That one's that these are normally hard when you have to do two antiderivatives and add them, or even sometimes you're going to have to subtract them. Okay. That's, that's where it gets tricky and you got to just be organized with your parentheses and brackets. All right.